welcome everyone to Behind the Lens, a program that we do at the Museum of Contemporary Photography at Columbia College Chicago. This is such an exciting way to learn more about artists that we work with in the museum, that we exhibit or hold in our permanent collection. And we are, we are um, excited to have the opportunity to see artists in their own studio spaces talking about their work. Um, on this Zoom platform, we're able to be all around the world uh, seeing more behind the scenes. So today we have Jeffrey A. Wollin joining us in Chicago in his studio. And I'll just give a brief introduction to Jeff and then hand it over. If you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A or the chat. And at the end of Jeff's um, talk or presentation of his work, we'll have time to just chat with him and ask questions and, and have some time together. So um, with that, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, Jeffrey A. Wollen is Ruth N. Hall's Professor Emeritus of Photography at Indiana University. His photographs have been exhibited in over 100 exhibitions in the U.S. and Europe, including solo shows at the Art Institute of Chicago, International Center of Photography in New York, the George Eastman Museum in Rochester, New York, and the MOCP. And he has been included in group exhibitions at MoMA, the Whitney Museum, and the L.A. County Museum of Art. His work is also held in numerous permanent collections um, all over the world, including the Metropolis Museum of Art, Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, and the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art in Kansas City, among many others. He is included in dozens of books, including six monographs, and he's the recipient of two visual art artist fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts and a Guggenheim Fellowship. His work is currently on view at the Catherine Edelman Gallery in Chicago, and that exhibition is called Faces of Homelessness, and it's on view until February 5th, 2022. So we hope that if you're in the area, you're able to go see that exhibition or get your hands on the publication of this work as well. So with that, Jeffrey Woolen, thank you for being here. I'm gonna hand it over to you. Well, thanks, Kristen. This is lovely. Thanks for all of you out there who are, who are joining us. Um, and uh, I'm going to just jump right in. And I thought I would torture you with uh, <laughs> my graduate thesis uh, because it's important to see my, the through line of my work as, as we walk through the various, uh, briefly through various of my long-term series uh, and spend most of the time today talking about my current project on homelessness. So this was a book. When I was in grad school, I went to RIT because of the terrific photography department, but also because of its excellent book arts program. So uh, this was my thesis, I, it's quarter bound leather. Um, let's see, I combined photographs and my own writing. I was, I was writing poetry and you can see from the image of the tree, uh, this was part of a long series of photographs of trees in urban settings that uh, I really wanted to be at Jay when I grew up. <laughs> and so these were five by seven contact prints on gold tone printing out paper. At the time I was working at the George Eastman uh, house, it was called then now the George Eastman Museum and um, really immersing myself in the history of photography. I was in the dark room. I was printing Lewis Hines negatives and some Aaron Siskind and, and uh, Alvin Lane and Coburn. And I was really, really learning the processes of photography and the, the history of photography. But you can see that I was already interested in, uh, in, in photographs and language. But I, but I and, and then shortly thereafter of my thesis, um, I moved to Indiana, Bloomington, Indiana to teach at Indiana University, which was a great gig. And I continued to be a straight photographer for a number of years. And then, um, you know, uh, I realized that I was missing something in my work. And I didn't know what that was until we had an exhibition in our uh, fine arts gallery of work by folk artists from the South, including uh, Howard Finster and Sister Gertrude Morgan. And uh, that's a Howard Finster on the left and a Gertrude Morgan painting on the right. And I just loved the way that their, their handwriting was integrated into their, into their artwork. And a little light bulb went off and I was like, oh, I, I could do that. Um, there were really not many examples in photography of people working with text in this direct of a way. People would, like Dwayne Michaels and Jim Goldberg, would write around the, uh, the borders, you know, uh, not touching the, um, you know, the image area per se, because this was still the late modernist era. This was just before postmodernism, and you couldn't 
you couldn't violate the the uh, pictorial plane. So um, yeah, I, I got the idea to start writing and I grabbed a portrait of my dad uh, that I had made and all these memories came rushing back of my childhood and the difficult life that he led so that so that his kids could have a better life. And um, I just started writing on it. And uh, I don't have very good handwriting or anything like that. So I just grabbed an ink pen and started writing on the photograph. And, and it, it was it was it felt great. It felt right. And so um, uh, I, I guess I would add that uh, the Museum of Modern Art bought this piece. So so they thought it was OK, too. And um, so I began to make a whole series of images uh, that related to my to my, you know, formative experiences growing up in childhood and adolescence and my early adulthood. At the time, I was still a fairly early adult. So um, before I worked, before I went to grad school, I worked for two years as a police photographer in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And it was talk about formative. Uh, I'd never seen a dead person before. And so, um, you know, photographing uh, autopsies and, and accidents and suicides, it, it really was life changing. And it taught me about it taught me about the kinds of things that uh, we don't really typically talk about the very dark parts of, of humanity. So um, when I was doing this autobiographical stuff, I found a way to deal with my past with these two years that were had stuck in my head uh, as as a, uh, you know, as amazing experiences that most people perhaps don't have, but that really brought me along as a photographer and trained me as a photographer and kind of conditioned me as a photographer as to what, how photography could be used to document. And so, um, yeah, this is, this is a piece about those experiences and it was rather therapeutic for me to get this stuff out. By then I had sort of switched and I was using this beautiful silver marker, which became sort of kind of my trademark. And uh, I was in Indiana University and um, I had sort of run out of <laughs> things to say about myself after a few years of these autobiographical pieces. So I began to think, well, what kinds of things could I work with uh, outside of myself, outside of my own experiences? Could this autobiography be transferred into biography? Could I work with other people? And, uh, and their experiences. As it happened, just around then, there was a murder in Bloomington of a graduate student, an English graduate, English major uh, graduate student in, at Indiana University who had gone off to the west side of town called Pigeon Hill and was murdered and dismembered. And uh, the police um, never found her head. Uh, and it was just a gruesome thing. And I was, I had decided to go up and photograph on Pigeon Hill to see what I could see. Remember, I'm into like crime and punishment and all that. So what would the people up there remember about Ellen Marks and, and how would they remember her and what would they tell me? So I met this guy, Kenny, and um, we started talking about Ellen and he said, you know, I was married to Ellen. And that was a very odd thing to say. She wasn't married. And he said, well, it was a Sioux custom. I'm part a Native American. And if a, if a man steps into a, a, a teepee with a woman, she was living in a, a lean-to up on the hill, uh, they are considered as man and wife. And he said, you know, I made a robot, a full-size robot of Ellen to help the FBI catch the murderer. Would you like to see it? I was like, <laughs> of course. So he brings down this thing that he'd carved out of styrofoam. He put his sister's false teeth into it and he, was trying to help the police catch the murderer. So this was what my introduction to Pigeon Hill. And I began to expand. And I actually, my very first exhibition at the Museum of Contemporary Photography 30 years ago was this series of rather large format. Uh, they were 20, 20 by 24 and 40 by 50 prints of uh, photographs I'd taken with a medium format camera, black and white film, uh, selenium toned uh, uh, Portriga, and I was, um, you, you know, write handwriting on the photographs, uh, but I was deciding to use a more formal um, <clears throat> stenciled uh, typo, typography rather than uh, my own handwriting. It seemed appropriate. 
And um, as it happens, I got a Guggenheim Fellowship to complete that project. I'd spent about two or three years working on it, maybe four years. And I thought I could bring it to a book, make it a book and complete it if I had a year off from teaching. And I was given that year off from teaching, but it didn't, my interest changed during that year as can happen. And I decided to engage in two long-term series, begin two long-term series. One was portraits of Holocaust survivors, which was an idea that was percolating in me for years. And uh, Vietnam War veterans, the, the war of my generation. So um, I started with this portrait of a, a guy named Michel Vogel, Mike Vogel, who um, was coming to Indiana University to speak to students. And um, I was introduced to him and I went to his home and made this photograph of him. And here he was just kind of, because he had spoken frequently about his experiences, he was very matter of fact about everything. And he had a little picture, a little snapshot of his father, a, a formal uh, studio portrait on his mantle and I asked him to hold the portrait. And for a moment he dialed back, his father was killed at Auschwitz. Mike was survived Auschwitz. He dialed back to his memories of his father and he put his hand over his heart and he closed his eyes and he, and he cried. And it was a very intimate, beautiful moment. He, this man who had been so well protected against these dark experiences from his past began to open up to me. And it was very beautiful. So um, I expanded the project and I worked with other survivors in Indianapolis. And then I expanded to Skokie, Illinois, a Chicago area has an enormous population of what well, used to, it's, they're, they're all aging out and dying. Although this woman was a child survivor and we're still in touch. She's still alive, still, uh, still doing quite well. Let me read you her, her story because it's, um, it's really amazing. My first memories really come to me when I was three and a half year old in 1942, when all the Jews from Sosnovietz were herded into the ghetto. At that moment, when my mother was separated from us children, she got very upset and panicky and she ran to the first building that she could approach. And we ran after her and as she ran upstairs, we tried to catch up with her and she ran to the third floor and she jumped from the window. So when the war was over and my Polish mother decided to take me to the Jewish school, when I went there, I recognized I am not in my environment. I figured out those must be those terrible Jews. And I was so afraid, I was so petrified that I decided, first chance I have to, I have to run away from here. I started to scream and yell, help, help. Jews are taking me for matzah. Jews are gonna kill me. And almost I caused a pogrom and people came with sticks. Later, my own father, my natural father came and I was taken forcefully to the city of Sosnovietz. And all I wanted to do was run, jump from the window. I was afraid of those Jews. So um, in the book and the exhibition, um, we had, we paired snap, I asked everyone for a snapshot from the time of the war. And this was when, this was a photograph she saved from the time right after the war, when her father uh, took her away from the Christian family that, that saved her during the war and uh, brought her to, back to Sosnovietz and brought her to the studio and did this portrait. I didn't know at the time that I did her portrait in the back in her backyard that it would be like the same photograph that she'd be holding flowers and her, her expression would be rather similar, but um, and her hairstyle is even quite similar. But this became a, a really something I explored fully with my sense of past and present, then and now, memory, uh, the creative nature of memory, how we construct memory. This is Henry Wordinger. They took a group of us and they sent us by train to Linz Zwei, a satellite camp of Mauthausen to work at Hermann Goering Works. The conditions were really bad at Linz. The longer we, we were there, the worse it got. Hunger, that was the main thing. I could hardly walk. I was so weak from hunger. So here's the cover of the book. And there's the, the uh, snapshot of Mike. He, uh, he was liberated by, uh, by the Americans and he actually worked, he actually became part of the US Army as a translator. He could speak, I don't know how many languages, certainly English and, and Polish and Russian and German. And so uh, he was valuable and, and became a translator and that helped him. Uh, he had family in Detroit and came to the US after the war. 
So the other project was Vietnam War veterans and I had done some of them. And I had decided that, you know, with the clock running out on the, on the Holocaust survivors because they were aging and dying, this was, uh, you know, in the, um, in the uh, 90s, mid 90s, early to mid 90s, late 90s, um, that I would stop for a bit with the Vietnam War veterans. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I decided to pick it up when we invaded Iraq, that was 2003. And it just seemed like another stupid war that had a fake reason for, for beginning. Uh, you know, Saddam Hussein had nothing to do with, uh, not with 9-11 and attacking the US, but nevertheless, we went in there and uh, soldiers were there. And I knew that um, the Vietnam veterans would be sort of upset about this because they went through their experiences with the idea that, okay, we did, we sacrificed, but uh, we lost our friends. We, we had injuries, we had psychological injuries and PTSD, but that's worthwhile if the United States learned a lesson and doesn't embark on another foolish venture again. But here we were embarking on another foolish venture again. So I began uh, to, to photograph uh, Vietnam vets. I, I picked up, I contacted the ones that I had photographed 10 years earlier, but, uh, I was only able to find a few of them. Some had died, some had moved away. Um, one guy had dr drank himself to death. And so uh, I worked with organizations um, like the Vietnam, uh, Vietnam Veterans uh, Art Museum in Chicago. Uh, Dick Luger, the Senator from Indiana at the time had a thing called the Veterans History Project, which recorded the stories of all war veterans, but certainly Vietnam vets and had good contacts for me. And, uh, and I did this and I, I went all around the country, photographed, you know, east from, from the, the Canadian border to the Gulf, from uh, New York to California. In fact, this is in Santa Monica. And this is in New York, actually uh, Jersey City across from Manhattan. You could see even where, uh, where the towers had been struck in 9-11 in lower Manhattan. Um, and David is wearing a Vietnam Veterans Against the War. Um, hat and um, he's sort of crucifying himself and on this metal fence, which, which is, surrounds a, a, a very classical war memorial for, for I think World War II veterans or World War I veterans. In any case, um, he was very anti-war and um, was self-medicating with, with heroin, uh, got AIDS from, from needles and, and died not long after I had, I had taken this picture. But I had a solo show of this work at the Museum of Contemporary Photography. And uh, you can see again, what I asked each person was a picture of themselves from the war. And here he is on patrol in, uh, in Vietnam on the, in that small snapshot. Uh, my photograph is 40 by 50. And then I, we did text panels. So instead of writing on the photographs, I decided to use my typographic skills, which I learned at RIT and, and worked with text panels. So I. I wanted to um, reference the Maya Lin uh, Vietnam uh, War Memorial in DC. So like a carved, uh, a carved stone monument. And um, yeah, that's, that's what I did. So one of the veterans that after one of the exhibitions, one of the veterans suggested to me that, uh, that I also look at the other side of the war, the, the, uh, the North Vietnamese uh, army and that he had fought. And uh, I said, um, well, how would I do that? I mean, what's, I don't speak Vietnamese, how would I find them? And he said, you know, I don't think it would be so hard. So I contacted one of the people that I photographed, actually, uh, he was a famous writer who won the National Book Award named Larry Heineman, who lived in Chicago. And I said, and I knew he was, he was part of a, a group of writers that went to uh, Vietnam to work with writers in Vietnam and brought Vietnamese writers to the US to, um, to share their experiences and to write you know, to, to influence each other as writers. So um, I began to, uh, I began to make contacts with, uh, with the North Vietnamese government, which is now the Vietnamese government. I worked with the Ministry of Culture and they helped me find uh, NVA, National, or, uh, North Vietnamese Army regular uh, soldiers. Um, and I began to, to do their interviews. I, the uh, guy from the, from the, uh, Museum of, uh, that Museum of Culture uh, was the translator. And so we did videotape interviews of everybody. And, and then he was giving me in, you know, simultaneous translations. 
And I went back home and I excerpted the parts of their story that were really powerful. And um, what became interesting to me was pairing the stories, this kind of duality of people, uh, the, the Vietnamese, uh, the, you know, the Vietnam veterans, the Americans that I photographed and their stories with the North Vietnamese army and Viet Cong, the soldiers in the South of, of the country during the war. And so um, here, these gentlemen are both, are both seated. They're holding an object. You can see the man on the right has lost part of his hand when a grenade went off. The guy on the left is a Ho-Chunk living in Wisconsin on a reservation. Um, he's, a, he's a tribal elder. Um, he died not long ago, actually. But they both fought in the war, and they were both up in, by the demilitarized zone. Uh, Owen Mike on the left, and actually hanging on my wall here, <laughs> uh, was, um, oh, and at the Museum of Contemporary Photography, they had blown this up to like 10 by 15 feet, and it was in the window on Michigan Avenue. It was really cool. So, um, uh, so Owen, uh, you know, was a Marine, and he was, he used to walk the point, and he was um, fighting up around the DMZ in, in, uh, in the northern part of South Vietnam. And the guy, um, let's see, his name is No We Fat on the right, um, was, was, uh, was an officer in the um, NVA, in the North Vietnamese Army. And again, you can see his hand is completely uh, obliterated. And, and yet he's offering us, us this fruit, this gift, you know, this, this gift of life. And it was, it was lovely. So I started starting to, to pair the images. And that became really interesting. So here are our two soldiers, an NVA officer who's been well decorated, as you can see with his, the medals on his chest. And he's standing at the Pacific, uh, the Sea of China and the Pacific Ocean uh, in Vietnam on the left. And Mark Scully, the guy who was the cover of the book, standing in Santa Monica at the Pacific Rim um, here, here in the US. And I thought that their, their stories had a lot of you know, uh, coincidences and there was just lots of, just photographically, there was so much interesting stuff going on in looking back and forth between these two men who, who fought against each other. <clears throat> and I would say this about when I went back to, to Viet, when I went to Vietnam with my, my friend John, who was a Vietnam vet, is that there was so much warmth between him and the, and the soldiers that we met, that we interviewed, that I interviewed and photographed. They were like, we, we would meet in, in groups uh, of, of, of Vietnamese uh, soldiers, these Vietnamese uh, uh, veteran uh, organizations uh, in the different cities up north, in Hanoi and other places. And we would gather around tables and they would give us gifts and we would drink toasts. And then John would stand up and say to, to whoever was off across the table, my name is John and I was uh, here I was in Vietnam. And I'm so glad I didn't shoot you. <laughs> and the person across the table would say, oh, I'm so glad I didn't shoot you. And then they would hug and, you know, it was very moving. And clearly they were not enemies. Um, they, their experiences brought them together. So the pairing of images was really fun. I had an exhibition finally, the, the project that started out as Inconvenient Stories at the Museum of Contemporary Photography became from all sides and was shown in various museums. Here it is at a a biennial in Lyon, France. And we paired, what we did was the portraits, which were fairly large, I made a text panel. And so you can see the one of, um, of uh, uh, Mark Scully on the, on the right. Um, the text panel is again, this white, white on black. For the South Vietnamese, I expanded it to include the Arvins, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, the South, our allies <clears throat> in the war from South Vietnam who many of whom were sent to re-education camps when the war was over, uh, and then came eventually many of them. There's a million of Vietnamese living in the US now, uh, thanks, to, uh, thanks to the war. And um, so I, I used the color of their flag, which is, which is red on yellow background for their portraits. And then the two next to it, or three next to it, are um, yellow ink on red background, which again references their flag, which is a yellow star on a red background. So um, when that project ended, um, 
another there was there was another uh, article in our newspaper um, about a woman who was killed and her body wasn't found for a few days and here's a television feature about this woman young missing mom of two body just found in cornfield north of bloomington and i immediately recognized her as one of the kids that i'd photographed on pigeon hill years earlier there she is uh, as a kid with her aunt judy and um, it brought me back to the hill i'd always want i always liked the portraits but i never completed the project i I went off and did the project with the, the series with Vietnam vets and, and Holocaust survivors. But the, her murder brought me back to the hill. And I wanted to find out what her last days were like. So I talked to her parents and her aunt. And um, she'd just really fallen in to, uh, to a life of drugs. And her boyfriend was, uh, was a meth, you know, was cooking meth. And the night she, he was cooking meth the night that she disappeared. And it, he, he was. He was never convicted of first degree murder, but he did serve some time for, for her death. And so I began to pair uh, the photographs that I had done in Pigeon Hill in the, uh, in the late 80s and early 90s with ones that I went back and re-photographed. So you can see here, there's Aunt Judy and she's aged, um, what, by 20, 20, 25 years. And since um, Crystal was dead, She's here. She is holding a portrait that I did of Crystal. And here's a, a guy, Timmy, that um, that I photographed frequently. Uh, I watched him grow up over the, the four years that I that I photographed. And here he is, uh, 20 years later, in prison. He was in a, a um, you know a, a maximum security prison. His crime, he didn't pay child support, and he'd done time at this prison. With, there are murderers in this pool with him, in this in this prison with him, and he had done uh, I forget altogether about two and a half years for not paying child support. That was his crime. It was insane that he was incarcerated. He should have been out there working and making money to pay his child support. But there you have it. And so I began to learn a little bit about how the the prison system had become extremely corrupt. It had become a prison industrial complex. They privatized prisons. So the incentive was to keep people behind bars because the prisons, the private prisons were making money. Anyway, uh, long story short, um, I, Timmy and I are now good friends and um, he's out, he works for Indiana University. And uh, we, we talk every, about twice a year, three times a year, we, we talk and um, he's, he's doing really well now. He's married, he's got a kid, um, got a full-time job, and he's paying his child support, where his kids are almost pretty grown now. So I'll read you this one. Uh, this was a guy that I, that I admired tremendously. His name was, uh, his name is Kevin. And um, a guy named, the, the one on the left, a guy named Dirk shot me with a 410 shotgun out at Lake Monroe. We'd all been drinking. I heard the pow. I looked down and saw blood covering my leg. I used my shirt as a tourniquet, I just gotten out of the Marines. I took your photograph of my wounds to the prosecutor and it was used at the trial to convict him. He got eight years and served a year and a half. So Timmy's doing two and a half years for child support, lack of child support payment. And this guy who tried to kill Kevin got a year and a half. And then on the right, I'm 50 now. I was almost 25 when I got shot. When I look at this scar, I feel that I'm blessed. I spent three years in the hospital thinking I could be dead and this third day would be my funeral. In that instant, my life could have been over. It made me think how important my family was to me. It also made me think, if I can survive this, I can survive anything. So here's a guy, Danny. Uh, he was, um, I photographed him with his girlfriend and his dog. He says, you know, there, those were good times back then. So this is from, from a 1989 portrait. And then 2012, and Danny had become uh, homeless in that intervening uh, period. And this is Wendy, who is a hero. Um, she's, I'll just read her story real quick. I was only four when I saw my first stabbing, a, a drug deal gone bad. I knew I had to be tough just to survive on Pigeon Hill. My mom was a nurse, but she got into drugs and left when I was nine. Odds were I'd have a kid by the time I was 15, like my friends. But I didn't want that. I wanted to get off the hill. Then the one on the right. 
I live out in the country with my husband, Luke, and sometimes my daughter. She has a more protected childhood than I did. I'm employed as a water quality engineer at the Indian, Indiana American Water Plant in Terre Haute. It's a 54.4 mile commute from home to work every day. I've taken up drag racing on the weekends in a 1973 Plymouth scamp that my husband Luke modified for me. So here's the, here's the cover of the book. The, the now portrait is uh, the back cover. And uh, this show um, was traveling for a few years. Oops. So I'm uh, ending that series now with the, with the portrait I did of Danny. So um, what I'd done with the Pigeon Hill work was I, by then I'd switched, it was, a, it was the 2000s, and I'd switched to medium format digital. But when I went back to these, I wanted to match the look of the original black and white photographs. Um, and so I, uh, you know, not hard to do with digital. I, I, you just got, if you want to make digital images into from, from the raw files into black and white, you just got to know a trick or two. And, um, but here's the original uh, file of Danny. So, um, you know, I moved to, uh, to Chicago and, uh, you know, so about eight or nine years ago and I was living downtown. I still live downtown and we have, a, like many cities, uh, we have a, a large homelessness uh, crisis and people are on the streets. And I was curious about what their lives were like. I knew about Danny because, uh, you know, I met and interviewed Danny. Um, and um, I was like, well, what, if, you know, that's rural sort of, uh, or small town homelessness. What's it like for these people in the city? And so I thought, well, I could just walk around the streets and, and photograph people, but that struck me as a bad idea. I thought, you know, I, I always worked with the idea of uh, mutual respect and informed consent uh, and people knowing what it was, who I was and what my, you know, what my, what my photographs were about. And I wanted them to, you know, to embrace that. So I decided to contact uh, uh, the Chicago Coalition for the Homeless, which is a very respected organization that helps advocate for, for homeless issues. And they embraced me. I had just gotten the, the Pigeon Hill uh, book and had an exhibition here at a museum in Chicago. And so they knew who I was and they, were, they thought, well, we would love to work with you. And so they introduced me at first to their leaders group. And uh, their leaders consist of people who are currently or more likely formerly homeless, who go to the shelters, who go out into the tent cities and help a homeless uh, find shelter, find food, find ways to get off the streets. So um, this, is, uh, this is one of the leaders. And Tom, this guy, Tom, has become a really close friend and has helped me immensely over the last four years. First time I was homeless, I was 14 years old. I was kicked out of the house. There were seven of us kids. I was the oldest. My dad died when I was six, my mom when I was 12. I heard about Uptown Tent City and I wanted to totally get involved. Got a propane stove and tank and I started cooking for the community. I set up a storage tent to keep things for survival purposes. There were about 25 of us under the Lawrence Viaduct under Lakeshore Drive and about 20 under Wilson. I got elected mayor of Tent City. I'm homeless, but I'm happy. I'm doing what I enjoy doing, helping people. Here's another leader who is currently very much housed. Three years ago, I had a double mastectomy and 16 nodes removed from my left arm. I had six months of chemotherapy. I was in the process of buying a house, but had to use the money for my chemo. During that time, I cared for my kids, took them to school each day. I'll graduate in May 2019 with a degree in business administration and then go on for my master's. I want to work with homeless and cancer survivors to help them deal with their problems and to pay back what people did for me. And Maxika just got her master's uh, a month ago, and she wants me to do her graduation portrait, which I will very gladly do. But I love this portrait. I love the way she had everyone dress up in their, in their Sunday best. And um, so um, as you can see, I'm working with uh, back to um, not handwriting, but typographic uh, use. But instead of a text panel, I really wanted the, the text to be fully integrated into the portrait so that you had to look at the face when you were reading the story. And when you're reading the story, you were aware of the, of the person's face and their gestures. And so, um, so these, are, these are the stories. They're based on the interviews that I conducted with each of them. 
So this guy, uh, Andon Kostov, I escaped from Bulgaria on Friday the 13th, 1985. I was a political refugee. When I escaped, the communists were still in power. People disappeared. I was afraid I would disappear too, so I run. A cousin of mine moved from Bulgaria to Chicago. They found me and I came to Chicago. I got a job in construction. I had a problem with my lungs and started slowing down. I have COPD, arthritis and back pain. I didn't have the means to see a doctor. I came home one day after work and found all my possessions in the alley. I had fallen behind on my rent. I became homeless. So what I really wanted to do in this series was show the different mechanisms. Well, first of all, my premise is that learning this from CCH and from other homeless organizations that I work with, that homelessness is not what we think of the stereotype of homeless as all mentally uh, ill or drug addicts or alcoholics. There are that, that is a population and a sizable one, but that is not the, the majority of homeless people. The majority of homeless people are invisible. They're living doubled up with family. There are 16,000 kids in, in the Chicago public school system that don't have a permanent address. They're living doubled up. People live in shelters. They live in uh, places for veterans. There are, there's housing for veterans, that, there's temporary housing. There's, there are different mechanisms. People live in tent cities or, you know, you don't see them. And um, this guy, when I photographed him, was, uh, was living in a place, a long-term shelter for people with medical needs called the Boulevard. This is a woman, and, and a lot of uh, uh, homeless people are full-time employed. They're, this woman is a nurse. She's a CNA, a certified nursing assistant. Across the country, these are the people who take care of people in nursing homes. They, they wash people in the hospitals that, you know, they're incontinent and, and it, you know, recovering from, from serious illness. And uh, they make on average 12 or $13 an hour. And if you think you can live in Chicago or San Francisco or Los Angeles on 12 or $13 an hour, you, you're wrong, you can't. So she lives in a tent city that's a very well regulated one. They care for each other, they, someone is always there watching each other's properties. They have a, a hierarchy, you know, they elect officials. The alderman for this area has trash removal, they bring in sanitation, people bring food. Uh, there's, a, there's a food truck that comes by, there are medical services. So it's not really, uh, you know, um, somebody on the street screaming at you. And, and um, I wanted to show that. So this is Vinny. Uh, I decided to expand to the West Coast. I thought it was important that it not just be Chicago in the Midwest and, you know, a big Midwestern city, but also, um, an area out west, the, the Los Angeles, and specifically Venice Beach, is exploding with, with homeless. And um, the problems there are different than the problems of Chicago. People live outside more, more in LA because they don't freeze to death. And um, so the tent cities have sort of exploded. And um, this is Vinny. He says, homeless has become a dirty word. It should, it should be a hate crime to use that word. I don't like the stereotype. We're not all the same. I'm not a shitty homeless person. I'm an artist. I've earned that right. I have my art supplies and my bass guitar and that's it. I don't have piles of stuff. I'm not a hoarder. My work is fun. I like a certain depth of texture. I get canvases donated and I just paint over them. I paint a lot of clowns. They scare the shit out of kids. They scared me when I was a kid. I sold a big painting the other day in a leather, and a leather trench coat that I painted a mural of clowns on. If I had my own place, I'd fill every square inch with murals because that's what my life is, one big painting. And this is a guy, Lorenzo, who's um, from Mexico and worked as a house painter for, for in Los Angeles for years and um, lived in his truck. He, uh, he, he got ill and he couldn't afford medical care. He lost his job because he got, became violently ill when he was around the painting solvents. And he started living in his truck with his two dogs. And he doesn't live in a shelter because they separate people from their dogs and he didn't want that. So he lives in a truck and the rules are you have to move your vehicle uh, every three days in Venice. You can't, you, know, you, you can't say park permanently. And one time they impounded his vehicle and had his medications and all, all that and he had to rebuild his life. 
this is a young man named Rose. Um, I work, I've been working with a place in Venice Beach called SPY, the Safe Place for Youth. And it's an absolutely lovely organization. I visited several times and they really take care of kids. Kids can just, they're, they're homeless kids, they're runaways. Um, they, they, they go there and it's a nurturing, positive environment. They, they can take art classes and music classes. They do their homework after school. There's a place for them to stay if they need a bed. They feed them. It's just a lovely place. I, I donate to them every year and I urge you all to do the same. So this is a guy named, uh, he calls himself Rose. He was a gangbanger who left when he had his first kid as a teenager and got badly beaten up by the gang and uh, fled that life and is now, um, is now doing well. This is Cecilia here in Chicago. And I, I love this portrait. I love the triple portrait. Her, the t-shirt the she's wearing and the, um, the Virgin Mary, uh, uh, of, of um, Guadalupe, uh, a painted uh, mural in Pilsen in, uh, in Chicago's um, Mexican uh, community. I'm a single mom of two boys. My oldest, his name is Juan. He is four years old and autistic, but not severe. My other son's name is Francisco and he's two. They are my world. I was living in a domestic violence relationship. I was unhappy for five or six years. I thank God for my kids and for opening my eyes to help me leave that life. Nothing is easy. I became homeless, excuse me, January 2nd, 2020. Me and my two kids sleep in, my, in the living room at my folks' house. We don't have anywhere else to go. My dad gave me an air mattress. Every night I have to pump it up. I have to put the covers and sheets on, give the kids pillows. Every morning I have to take the air out, fold it back up. My goal now is to go back to work and back to school to study child development. I wanna work at daycare, save money, and get an apartment of my own. It's been two months since I left my husband and moved to my parents' house. Set new goals for your life, especially if you have kids, to show yourself and your kids that mommy is able to do it. So um, just a few things about this. Um, she represents a large community. So uh, women living, leaving abusive relationships, domestic violence is a large part of the homeless community and leaving with their kids and they're vulnerable. They might be, have, they'll have to live doubled up with family. There are shelters around, around that, that will take them, but it's a very difficult life. And um, so uh, this was when she had just experienced homelessness for a few months. Now this is uh, almost a, a year and a half later, almost two years later, she's doing great. And she's got her own place and she has a job and her kids are in school and doing great. And she came to the opening at Catherine Edelman on Friday and we asked her to, to talk about her portrait, this portrait. And she started talking about the dark period she was in and the depression and how her kids gave her the strength to, to see a doctor and deal with the depression and get some medication. And that led her to leave the relationship and go to her parents. And now, she, like I say, she has her own place and she's, and while she was talking about this and, and how wonderful her life is now, she started crying and everybody at the opening started crying. It was just such a moving uh, experience. And Nicholas uh, is, is I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'll just I'll go a little quicker here. But I love this portrait. This uh, Nicholas is transgendered. He, tra he transitioned from uh, female to male um, as, a, as a teenager. But when he came out initially as a teen, his parents kicked him out of the house. He lived in a, um, he was put in a uh, mercy home for boys and girls. And now when I photographed him, he's living at a place called El Rescate. It's in... Um, the Puerto Rican um, segment of town near Humboldt Park. And um, he's pursuing a career as a musician, as a singer and performer. And he's in college and he's, he's this kid's going places. And here's Char, who um, is also Venice Beach. And she lives behind Gold's Gym, uh, where Arnold Schwarzenegger still, still uh, pumps iron. And there's a tent city there. Um, and she talks about how uh, she's married and she's got a dog. And um, the shelters um, make you give up. You can't, in many shelters, you can't be with your partner and they set, you can't have a pet. And these are the two, two most important things in her life. So she was, she's living in a tent on, um, you know, in, in Venice. Um, and she says, um, as she closes her story, she goes, um, 
It's not fun to have people look at you like they do. One time I was just walking when a man called me garbage. It made me really depressed. This is my buddy, David. This is, he lives uh, in the, behind uh, Google in Venice and he, um, he's an amazing college educated individual. He's, he became homeless when his family's business went out and he embraced it. And he's become a staunch advocate for homeless issues and for the homeless. And he makes and gives these little things that say more love, be love. And I was walking with David one time on Main Street in, in, um, in Santa Monica, and a guy was unloading an electric bike at a store, electric bike store on, on Main Street there. And he saw David and he said to him, did you make that? David was wearing this, one of these more love or be love things. And he said, yes. And the guy said, can I give you a hug? You, my, you gave one to my daughter. He gives them away for free. And uh, it changed her life. She's, it turned her life around. <laughs> and so this is David. He's just filled with this joy of living and this beauty and goodness. And um, whenever uh, there's, whether it's TV news or newspapers, the journals go to uh, Venice to talk about the LA housing pro crisis, he's very often the spokesman for that. And we're very good friends and we see each other every time I go out to Venice. This is, uh, this is Melody and she's a Native American. She's the fourth generation in her family to serve in, in, in the military. She was a hospital corpsman in the Navy and um, was, uh, was roofied and raped while she was in the Navy. Uh, she'd been in war zones and um, was, um, was raped and she reported it and she bore the brunt of it. People accused her of being a liar, of trying to ruin this man's uh, career. And uh, it led her to depression, to abusive relationships. She came back to Chicago, where she's from, and she turned her life around. In fact, right now, she is the executive director of the uh, American Indian Center. That's uh, it's a national organization centered in, in Chicago, and it advocates for Indian, for Native American issues. And I'll end with this one and leave some time for questions. I became homeless in August 2015 due to job loss and mismanagement of my funds. For a couple of years, I lived doubled up with my 80-year-old sister in Fox Lake until it became necessary to move on. I spent 331 days at Pacific Garden Mission. Many of the homeless folks there had mental issues. I had no experience with any of that. I had never slept on an army cot before. I had never showered with men before. I had to eat what they served. When the pandemic hit, they got me out of Pacific Garden Mission and took me to Hotel 166, an upscale hotel where the city rented rooms to isolate those of us at high risk. I was confined to my room. Lawndale Health Center tested me a couple days later and said I had the virus. My oxygen level was low. I lost my taste and smell. And then one day I said, I can smell food. My temperature, oxygen level, and breathing were fine. So they sent me back to PGM, Pacific Garden Mission, and quarant which is a horrible shelter, by the way, and quarantined me for 15 days and a month later, 15 days and a month, and a month later, I got this apartment. So he lives there. He's right by uh, Interstate 55 by the, the McCormick's uh, Convention Center. I got this apartment. COVID-19 changed everything for me, and I'm learning to live with the new norm. Mostly, I have to remember to wear a mask and practice social distancing. Being homeless is an ugly, sad, and frightening experience. I know most of us never imagined that it could happen to us, but in these perilous times, it could. And um, here's, here's the book <laughs> with uh, Tom on the, on the front cover and Cecilia on the back cover. It's just out. Kara Verlog published it. You should be able to get copies pretty soon. I'm going to get my my shipment next week. If any of you want to contact me, I'll be happy to sell you a book or you can get them on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and all the booksellers, but that will, they're listing April for a uh, release date, although they'll have them sooner than that. So other than that, I, I welcome uh, any questions. Um, Kristen, maybe you can <laughs> help out at this point. Yeah, thank you so much, Jeffrey. That was really a wonderful presentation. And I think um, very fitting for this time of year as we're wrapping up the year. And I know a lot of people are, are thinking about where to put their efforts with um, 
supporting one another right now and, and thinking about the holidays and compassion for one another. So it was it was very moving to watch this presentation and learn more about the, the people that you photographed. So while we wait, if anyone has questions, I have several that I have written down and, and one is, is in line with what I was just saying. How long do you usually spend with each subject um, and when you're creating a portrait and gathering the interviews, how extensive of a, a session is that when you're creating these? So, um, yeah, I, um, it varies. Um, I would say average of, of a couple of hours. And that's the initial contact. And then uh, sometimes I have to do a reshoot, you know? And um, so, so that's another couple hours. I do the, the interview at, at, at the, when I first meet them. And before I actually take the portrait, I, I interview them so I know what I'm looking, you know, what I'm looking for in the, in the story in the background. I consider myself an environmental portraitist, kind of in the Arnold Newman tradition. Um, and I look for envi their environmental portraits. There are I look for a, you know a, a connection between, especially like oops, oh I guess I can't, I can't go back. But anyway, with the one of Cecilia where she's wearing that T-shirt and she's against that beautiful mural with the Virgin of Guadalupe and and uh, her her expression and her look mimic those other layers. So I'm looking for layers of of texture and and information in the background. Um, so, um, you know, uh, I, I listen to their story first and then I, we look at what their possibilities are. Sometimes they want to be in their, in their space and that could be a shelter or it could be a tent or it could be their apartment, depending on, on their, their living status now, um, or they might want to meet at a park and, and whatever their choices, that's what we do. Um, and again, the whole session takes a couple of hours. Then I, um, go back and I, I, I use a questionnaire and I take the, the answers they've given me. I read everything back before I leave. And then I put it into a, a narrative that's, you know, if they say the same thing two or three times in a row, I don't, I only need once. So I, it's edited. And then um, I go back, I send them the edited version and say, is this okay? And I send them the proofs of the portraits and everybody ultimately will get a, a book and a, a 17 by 22 original a portrait from the edition. Plus, I donate a percentage of my, if I sell stuff, I, I donate a percentage to the um, Chicago Coalition for the Homeless. So, um, yeah, that's that's kind of how it works. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm just curious because I think with, with portraiture, I'm always asking those questions of artists working in portraiture because I, I can imagine how difficult it is to get the right portrait and, and somebody to be comfortable enough in front of the camera and that it's so much about a relationship. So, um, I commend you on on the portraits because they do seem um, like a, it, it's a nice exchange and, and the people seem very at ease in the portraits. Um, Mark Bello has asked, have you ever tried to portray the folks who fear the homeless? You mentioned the mentally ill are a minority, but people are often attacked here on the street. Sounds conservative, but fear is preventing real solutions that would arise from love. That's a great, that's a great question. No, I, I hadn't thought about the, the other side, and maybe that'll be my next project, but um, I, I, uh, what I'm doing with this project is trying to, um, so, so let's say this crisis is, is, is coast to coast, and if we're going to solve this problem, it isn't as simple as give everyone housing, put, build tiny homes, get everyone in shelter. You know, it, everyone needs food and shelter that you have to, to be human, you, you have to. Um, but there are some people whose mental illness or drug addictions keep them from living in a shelter. Uh, the shelters won't let them you, you know, in like that. And so they, that group is gonna need a kind of intervention that um, my friend here, Ronald, doesn't need. He just needed an apartment and now he's doing fine. You know, he's, um, Cecilia is doing fine. She just needed a place to stay. Uh, she's raising her kids, she's fine. So the solutions to homelessness vary depending on the group. And as I say, there are these different these different groups, and their needs are different. The the most the stereotypical one that that was it Mark who asked about, you know, the other side, the people who are uh, who fear the, the, those. There are some reasons to fear them. Um, I was walking back uh, on my a block from my apartment, and a homeless lady who just moved in in late fall. Uh, she was sleeping during the day, uh, and when she wasn't sleeping, she was just screaming or talking to herself and um, barefoot, she wasn't gonna survive the winter. 
in that. And she was vulnerable. She was in her mid thirties and people would have, it, it, it was not gonna end well if she stayed put. But she came up, uh, we heard a noise uh, next to us and we looked down and the, she had thrown a coffee cup. You know, people were bringing her food. People are very generous. They bring her food and somebody brought her a coffee and I guess she didn't want the coffee. So she threw it in the street. It's her prerogative, you know? So uh, we heard the noise and we looked over and then looked back and she started screaming at us. You think you're so special. You think you're so great. Well, I'm gonna beat the shit out of you. And she came over and spit on us. Well, okay, that's not okay. So um, I called 911, you know, she needed help. She was gonna be killed or, or um, was gonna freeze to death. She needed help and, not, and nothing I could do, you know, giving her food wasn't, it would give her temporary things, but she needed, you know, she needed intervention. And so that's what people think of as the homeless. And that's true, they do. But the vast majority are not. They're like Cecilia, they're like Ronald, they're, they're like Maxica, you know? Um, they, they're, they're self-sufficient. They just need, from time to time, if they're living doubled up, they need their own place. Need, some of them need job training, some of them need daycare. Um, so, so um, but it's a very interesting question, like, it would be really fascinating to hear everyone's stories about home. You know, when you interacted with homeless, what 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 happened? What are your thoughts? How do you think a problem could be fixed? Right. Yeah, and I wonder. I mean, I think a lot of people know those experiences. You know, they know the stories of people who have encountered situations on the street that are unfortunate like that. We don't know as much these stories of how people came to the situations and like you're saying, how different it can be from those, um, those extreme examples that, that we've seen, especially when we live in big cities. Um, so I, I'm curious about, you said you um, printed for or studied with Lewis Hine or worked with Lewis Hine at the beginning. Um, and I know he's like, you know, one of the fathers of social documentary photography or social practice photography. Do you think of yourself as an activist with this work or is it more just about documentary work and, and telling the stories or like how much is that motivating? It's like trying to convince people um, to do something. Okay, <clears throat> disclaimer, I, I was born after Lewis. Right, Hyde. I know, I, that's why I was like, I don't think you worked for him, I was trying to remember what you said. <laughs> well, we had his negatives at the Eastman House and we were printing them for publications and for exhibitions and things of that sort if we didn't have a, an existing print uh, you know, that he made uh, back in the day. So um, I became really familiar with his work and, and it was very, uh, very formative. Uh, so, so I was influenced by his approach, by, by his caring for immigrants or child labor, or which uh, oddly enough, a hundred years later are now important issues once again. And um, yeah, so, so Lewis Hine was, 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 a, was an influence for sure. And um, I think of myself as, as uh, working in the realm of creative documentary, because I don't know what Lewis Hine would think about me writing on my pictures, <laughs> you know, he might think it's cool. I don't know. Um, I became friends with Walter Rosenblum, who was a disciple of, of Lewis Hine, and um, we became friends. And um, at first, he, when I started writing on my pictures, he was put off, definitely. And he couldn't really comment on them. And, and then we were on a panel together somewhere, and I was doing the Holocaust work. And he came up to me afterwards and he said, I get it now. So um, working in that Lewis Hine tradition, but taking it, you know, into the now the 21st century, um, with, in a more postmodern kind of a, a approach using language and narrative, which is cool again. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I have another question about that. And I see there's a comment that Mark um, put in the, in the Q&A just saying thank you and that, um, that he's suffering from compassion fatigue because of a personal experience. <laughs> so I'll, I'll share it there with you so you can see this. Um, but okay. I, <laughs> I was wondering with the writing too, um, this seems much more like trans transcription of an interview, but the earlier work with the silver pin, um, how much time did you spend crafting the writing component? Are you doing that more stream of consciousness or is it really like something that you go back and forth on a lot with editing and creating that text? Okay, good, really good question. So when I first started writing, it was my own stories. It was my experiences. So, uh, and, and I have a background in English literature. I, was, I wanted to be a writer, you know? So um, I shifted to photography because it gave me the, it just was right for me and it gave me the ability to do narrative. 
you know, tell stories. And so, um, and I just loved, I loved the camera. I loved the dark room. So, uh, so then um, I, 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 after I ran out of things to say about myself, I started uh, working with, with other people and they would tell me their stories and I would retell them in my own words. So that was an editing process and I would show them what I was writing and so on. Uh, and that was certainly true of the Holocaust survivors. By then I was doing videotape. I thought I might make videos to go with the shows, which I did. And uh, so, so the, I would do a videotape interview, then do excerpts and then send them a copy of the videotape and send them the uh, excerpts and let them. But at first, like, so what I want to say is at first I was continuing to write, to edit, to, to tell their story in my words. It, it was their story, but I would say, well, you know, Michaud was sent to, the, to Auschwitz at the age of, you know, instead of him saying, well, and then uh, it occurred to me you know, not long into the project that their own words were so much more powerful than anything I could come up with. And who was I to tell their story <clears throat> of this horrific, uh, you know, and historic period of their lives? So I decided to go just to a straight, it was a transcription, but it was edited, you, you know, I, I might have to move a block here and there so that their story would be cohesive and make sense to a, to a viewer. And I, that's been basically how I've done it ever since. It's, it's, um, it's their own words. Um, sometimes with videotape, sometimes with just sitting there with a pad and the questionnaire and saying, tell me how you became homeless. Mm -hmm. yeah. But definitely all their own words at this point for quite some time. Yeah. Well, it's so interesting. I'm always a fan of text and image work, and I, I like that it is on the image because you can't avoid it either. With the with the caption or wall text off the side, I think it's easy to speed through looking at the captions. <laughs> and so, with your work, I always spend a, a long amount of time on the on the text because you really okay. require it in the images. So. Um, I think we are out of time, but if anyone has any more questions, please um, jump in. We can maybe take one more, um, but I want to be very respectful for, for your time, Jeffrey, and I just really appreciate you being here today and learning more about your excellent work. Again, we have a lot of this work in our collection at the Museum of Contemporary Photography. You can view all of that work on our website at mocp.org. If you're in the area, you can schedule an appointment to come see these works in person. But more importantly, if you're in the area of Chicago, I encourage you to go to the Catherine Edelman Gallery and see this ex exhibition that's up on view through February. Um, Don't forget the book. And the books, yeah. <laughs> There's, and if you, wanna, if you wanna catch a little bit more, um, BuzzFeed News did a, a really terrific review, a lengthy review about the work on, on Tuesday. So if you go to BuzzFeed News, you'll get, um, you'll get a, a more complete uh, story uh, com you know, uh, uh, of the process by which that evolved. And if you want to contact me, you can go to my website and there's contact info. Uh, love to hear from you. And donate money to the, to the Chicago Coalition for the Homeless to spy to uh, Brighton Park Na Neighborhood Council to these fabulous American Indian Center, all these fabulous organizations that do that do God's work. Well, thank you so much. And thank you all. I hope you all have a great holiday. And I look forward to seeing everyone in 2022. Have a great day. Thank you. <laughs> Bye all. Hey, Jeff.